Okay, let's get started. On behalf of the Business Coalition for a Clean Economy and the Pemina Institute, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar on what Clean BC means for business. I want to acknowledge that this webinar is being hosted from the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. I'm Drummond Lawson, Director of Sustainability for Arcteryx. Arcteryx is a global design and manufacturing company based in North Vancouver, specializing in technical high-performance apparel, outerwear, and equipment. Along with Climate Spartan Businesses, Interjex Renewable Energy, the Insurance Bureau of Canada, and Van City, Arcteryx is proud to be a founding partner of the Business Coalition for a Clean Economy, which is supported by the Pemina Institute. Our coalition is composed of leading BC businesses and organizations aligned behind a vision for a clean and prosperous economy and around climate action. We, br we believe that strong climate and energy policy provides certainty and is good for business. I encourage you to join us. Find out more online at pembina.org slash BC clean economy. Today, I'm also excited to announce that for Earth Day, Arcteryx is supporting the Pembina's Insti Pem Pembina Institute's leadership of the Business Coalition for a Clean Economy. Tomorrow, April 17th, 100% of the profits from our online sales will benefit the Pembina Institute's leadership. Today, well, we have a great lineup of speakers for you. They'll share their thoughts on BC's climate plan, Clean BC, and how it opens doors for businesses to innovate and to grow. You can type your questions into the GoToWebinar panel, and we'll try to get to them at the end of our program. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Karen Tamwu. Karen is the BC Director from the Pembit Institute. The Pembit Institute is Canada's leading clean energy think tank, working with governments and industry to support the transition to a clean energy economy. Karen, over to you. Thanks, Drummond. Hello everyone, thanks for taking time out of your day to join us uh, as I'm just trying to get my screen up. There we go. Oh dear, I love technology. There we go. Uh, it's great to have a diversity of participants joining us from all over BC and beyond and it's great to be part of this panel. I'm really excited to hear from the business leaders that we've invited uh, here today. And to put their perspectives into context, I'm going to give an overview of Clean BC, which is the climate and clean energy strategy that the BC government released this December, uh, this past December, and also some highlights from budget 2019, which was announced in February. So to put Clean BC into context and give you a sense of the big picture, uh, this is a plan that is for clean energy, a low carbon economy, and climate action that builds on a decade or over a decade that BC has had uh, of experience with climate policies and admittedly in fits and starts. I think it's worth noting that uh, Premier John Horgan acknowledged Liberal Premier Gordon Campbell's leadership of 10 years ago and so it's uh, encouraging to see some uh, cross-party, multi-party uh, work and, and continued commitment on this front. Clean BC is a plan that will move us away from fossil fuels and increase our use of clean, renewable energy. And the actions announced in Clean BC will achieve 75% of BC's 2030 carbon reduction goals. Clean BC contains some of North America's most stringent policies, some of which I'll highlight today. And I think it's also important to note that while others in Canada and elsewhere are stalling or even backpedaling on climate action, BC remains committed to move forward on, on a low carbon economy and BC's leadership on climate policies have been a model for others to follow. Uh, as an example, where BC is going on building codes, clean fuel requirements, and carbon pricing. This is a snapshot from the government of BC of how uh, business as usual would have gotten us. Um, you can see our emissions from 2007 are similar to uh, emissions from 2016, plus or minus a couple of uh, megatons. And with, without any new policies, we would have basically been around the same amount uh, this time in 2030, so right around 60 million tons. With the actions announced, as I said, we'll get to around 75% uh, of our, of our uh, 2030 goals with an additional 25% remaining. 
Um, what, this, what this means in actual tons is in BC, we're around 62 megatons or million tons. We're aiming to be around 38 million tons or 40% reduction of our 2007 levels and down to 13 million tons by 2050 or 80% of our 2007 levels. So Clean BC is about jumpstarting the low carbon economy. Clean BC promises to fuel growth in green jobs and clean innovation. And this month, the province will be launching the low, uh, as some examples, the province will be launching the Low Carbon Buildings Innovation Program, which has $1.8 million of funding for the next two years available to offer incentives for the development of advanced building designs, construction methods, and building components. The Clean BC Incentive Program for Industry, which is funded in part by the carbon tax paid by heavy industry, will encourage investment in clean tech, clean tech solutions and lower carbon industrial operations. The government is also developing a labor readiness plan, which is a strategy to ensure that the workforce that we have in BC will have the right skills in a low carbon economy. For example, constructing low carbon buildings and repairing electric vehicles. Clean BC also means more clean energy and less pollution. British Columbians will rely more on renewable electricity and clean energy and less on oil and gas to power our everyday needs. And while we don't expect that fossil fuels like natural gas, gasoline and diesel will disappear altogether over the next 10 years, we will be lowering the carbon intensity of these types of fuels by blending them with biofuels. And we'll hear more about that from Kel uh, at Parkland Refinery today. This requirement to reduce the carbon intensity of liquid fuels is called the Low Carbon Fuel Standard, and it's one of the highest impact initiatives under Clean BC. Uh, it could deliver up to 4 million tons of reductions. Uh, just to put that into context, we currently require about a 10% reduction in carbon intensity of fuels by 2020, and this will, re will increase to 20% reduction in intensity by 2030. There's also a new regulation in place or will be in place that requires that natural gas used for residential and industrial purposes must contain a minimum of 15% renewable gas content by 2030. We're going to see more zero emissions vehicles on the road under Clean BC. In just over 20 years, all new cars sold will be zero emissions. Many big ticket items in budget 2019 related to zero emissions vehicles include funding for incentives, training and research to lower emissions from our transportation sector, enabling legislation to meet the zero uh, emissions vehicle requirement. Uh, the Zero Emissions Vehicle Act was introduced in the legislature last week. This sets our increasing annual levels of zero emission vehicle sales over the next 20 years. So we're increasing to 10% by 2025, 30% by 2030, 100% by 2040. And as we're transitioning to zero emissions vehicles, like I mentioned, the gas and diesel we're putting into our cars and trucks will have a lower carbon footprint through the low carbon fuel standard. Initiatives that are currently available for businesses and individuals uh, include up to $6,000 for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, up to $5,000 for battery electric vehicles. And these are available at your point of sale uh, at the vehicle um, uh, car dealerships. Fleets can also sign on to West Coast Electric Fleets, uh, which is a pledge to gain, and that will allow you to gain access to a range of tools to help you assess and adopt zero emission vehicles in your business fleets. For more information about various incentives, check out cev4bc.ca. We're going to see uh, in just over 10 years, all new homes and buildings will be built to net zero energy ready standard, um, such as passive house standard. Net zero, ready, uh, net zero energy ready means that a home or building uses so little energy, it could generate its own renewable energy on site and be self-sufficient. So new homes and buildings will be super energy efficient, re resulting in lower carbon emissions from the building sector. Over the past year, government has announced significant incentives available to businesses and individuals to save energy and reduce emissions in existing and new buildings. There's support available to identify options to improve energy use and low carbon options in homes and buildings and support for equipment upgrades in existing buildings, such as switching to electric space and water heating or improving building envelopes or to help with capital costs of new energy efficient new construction. To grease the wheels for energy uh, retrofits for homes and buildings, government has provided funding to establish Efficiency BC. Efficiency BC makes it easier for home and property owners to access information about rebates, like what incentives are available through the various utilities and local governments, 
and help finding qualified contractors. Energy coaches are also available to assist in assessing incentives and facilitate project planning. Government is also in the process of developing a small business energy coaches, which will help or who will help facilitate efficiency and fuel switching projects in smaller buildings. And they're targeting fall for a rollout of this program. BC's gas sector accounts for uh, about 19% of the province's total emissions. The sector is already BC's largest source of industrial emissions and it will for, uh, potentially grow with further LNG development. So how uh, we're looking at reducing emissions from, from industry overall, um, the Clean BC Innovation Program, which I mentioned earlier, uses carbon tax from industry to incentivize low carbon innovations. Uh, and this supports not just the gas sector, but other high emitting industries such as mining, cement and forestry. Other measures that Clean BC identified include reducing emissions um, through, from the gas sector through electrification of upstream development and reducing methane. And government's also investing in hydrogen uh, and um, carbon capture utilization and storage. Finally, one of the other key pillars of Clean BC is uh, uh, updates to our Climate Change Accountability Act. This will be the first jurisdiction in Canada that has accountability mechanisms entrenched in law. We're looking for a transparent process for tracking and reporting on progress and making timely adjustments and ensuring that the latest science and technology is incorporated into our planning to make sure we don't miss our climate targets. Um, and finally, BC's climate plan, as I mentioned, will help us achieve 75% of our 2030 uh, carbon reduction goals. So there's a further 25% that we need to work to find in order to close the gap. There's plenty of heavy lifting to do in addition to implementing the actions and programs already announced. And across BC, individuals, communities, and companies all need to work together to put the plan in progress and to ensure that we all take action and play our part. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Okay, changing gears, we'll hand over to Elizabeth Sheehan, the president at Climate Smart Businesses. Climate Smart is a social enterprise based here in Vancouver. Its program enables small and medium-sized businesses, Arcteryx included, if we'll call ourselves medium, to profitably track and reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. It's really, um, it's really great to be part of this panel and part of uh, part of this group. Um, I'm really excited to share this new BC business data, and we call it a BEEP, which stands for Business Energy and Emissions Profile. And I'm excited to share it because I think it sets the context for what we're talking about on the webinar and really um, um, provides evidence, I guess, for the important role BC businesses um, are going to play in this transition to a clean economy. Um, I'd like to start out with, oh, actually, a thank you to Van City Credit Union, actually, for making this possible making the data available in a public, digitally interactive way. And um, I'm, uh, we're often sharing Van City's story of its leadership in terms of um, capturing or converting its waste heat from its computers to heat its building. But perhaps a little more selfishly, um, they've uh, helped almost a uh, little over 200 businesses access climate smart tools and training. So thanks to, thanks to Van City. Uh, just quickly, as, as Drummond mentioned, we're passionate about uh, training businesses to measure and reduce their emissions. We work with over 900 businesses to date, um, and businesses are saving not only on average 20%, but they're also, this is a small uh, sample of a case study, um, case studies that we have on our website of $4.5 million in annual savings at the same time. So there's a strong, strong business case. We started 10 years ago, mostly in British Columbia, and I'm happy to report that we were delivering programs last year in Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, and even St. John's, Newfoundland. And as we've gone, data has been a big part of what we wanted to share over time. So we would do reports on certain sectors, and um, the most recent is this one called 200 Million Tons, which was the calculation that we did of small, medium-sized businesses across Canada are managing and um, the opportunity to reduce that, um, that pool of emissions. And it turns out um, that's also the same amount of emissions we need to reduce to meet our Paris Accords. Five years ago, we started to produce business energy and emission profiles for cities across 
Canada and actually one in one in the US. And each of these green dots will take you to a live link on beep.eco so you can click on it and um, you can check out uh, each of the uh, each of the beeps in each of the cities. But what I'm going to walk us through today is our first provincial business energy emissions profile. And what I'm going to do is show you this screenshot of what you'll be able to access when you go on beep.eco. But you can see um, on the top our inter interactive um, tabs, executive summary, introduction, SMEs. Um, and you can see um, the summary of emissions, the total uh, number of businesses that are covered, the number of employees that are included in this data set, and where the sources of emissions are actually coming from across these businesses. And the bubbles represent the sectors that are covered. And then on the band below, you can see we actually have uh, the ability to interact and, and uh, parse the data by size of employee or business in terms of size of employee. But what the business energy emission profile is really uh, aiming to do is to answer a couple of questions. How many tons of CO2 do BC's SMEs emit annually? What are the main sources? What sectors have the largest share of this opportunity? And my favorite is what are businesses, what could they do? What could we potentially reduce and what are currently businesses in fact doing? So just a quick uh, reminder of the sectors that are included in, in our BEEP. Um, construction, manufacturing, they're, they're sectors where Climate Smart has had experience working. So things that aren't included would be utilities or healthcare. Um, and this bubble on the on the right shows you that um, the importance really uh, of, of small and medium sized businesses here um, in the province and in this study. So big question, how many tons of CO2 or SMEs emitting annually? Based on the businesses covered here, we're looking at 7.69 million tons of CO2, which is equivalent to 30 billion kilometers traveled. It also turns out to be 30% of BC's target, uh, target that we need to reduce by 2030. And you can also take a more of a focused sector. So from a construction standpoint, uh, the construction sector is contributing 27% of the emissions um, in this pool. So you can you can slice and dice by by sector with this with the beep. The main sources of uh, emissions across these businesses not surprising natural gas combustion and transportation. And if you want to apply a sector lens once again, each sector has a different makeup, and so construction sector would be 68% transportation and 25% um, on waste. So those are the key sources of emissions. Finally, what are what are businesses doing? So this is a small sample of um, uh, reduction plans and strategies that we know businesses who are coming through Climate Smart are are pursuing. And as you each each color code represents a different strategy: natural gas reduction, transportation, waste, electricity. And as the ideas to the left have more people who are using them, and the smaller ideas that you can click and hover on um, are are ones that may be emerging or a few few companies are trying so let's let's dive a little bit deeper and just look specifically here at, at transportation um, you can see the number of businesses that are pursuing um, teleconferencing and video conferencing as a way to reduce business travel um, but there's three strategies that we've seen uh, specifically that I wanted to, to, to even dive a little bit deeper um, around um, transportation which is fleet optimization electrification of equipment and alternative fleet power. So I'm going to share some quick case studies um, of, of companies that have come through come through Climate Smart. And um, so this is a HVAC company, a port terminal, and a manufacturer of a railway and utility. Uh, ties. All of each of these companies are pursuing optimization in some way, either route optimization, uh, right sizing their vehicles, so vehicle optimization, and even like processes in terms of anti idling and reservation systems. Um, they're, uh, as you can see uh, in the numbers, they're achieving anywhere from four thousand to five million in fuel savings, along with along with their emission reduction. So that's one example of some transportation strategy that we're seeing. Electrification of equipment. These are two examples of port terminals that are taking their propane and diesel forklifts and converting them to electric 
electric lifts. They've got a great payback period, significant emission reductions, and not only saving fuel, but also maintenance costs. So this is Western stevedoring and, oops, there's a typo, paper excellence, uh, formerly known as, as catalyst paper. And then finally, alternative fleet power. And um, I think I was mentioning to Karen in a conversation earlier that as the incentives are for electrification are increasing, we're seeing more and more businesses pursue and be signaled and accelerate um, their look at electrifying their fleet. But, but here's an example of an electric truck or local bike delivery that Mills is pursuing. Penfold's uh, Roofing is a construction company or a uh, roofing company, and they converted their fleet um, now not several years ago from uh, to to propane, saving money and uh, having a solid payback and 30 tons of emissions reduced. And then Lancy Tours, who's been a real leader in in finding and uh, developing an electric tour bus. So so those are small, perhaps um, business decisions, but I they really do add up and. This slide was our attempt to sort of add up. What, what would it look like if all of the businesses in the sectors where we've worked were able to achieve what we have seen businesses achieve in those sectors? So each sector has a different percentage reduction, but we're looking at 1.6, uh, you know, 7 million, million tons of greenhouse gas emissions. If all of the businesses were able to achieve what's kind of on average a 22%. And, um, you know, how do we get there and how do we get beyond there? Um, and that really does lead us back to the importance of, of policy supporting BC businesses and their role that they can play. And I and I'll um, just note that we're 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 testing we're pilot testing with the federal government a portfolio of uh, uh, emission reduction projects across businesses, accessing 25% of capital for making a project happen that wouldn't be able to happen otherwise. And this portfolio is uh, basically across eight to 10 businesses, about $14 million at uh, $11 per cost per ton. And one of the things that we have um, we really believe is there's lots of these uh, shovel ready businesses right below the surface that a, a, a powerful incentive fund could really leash action that would have been put off um, in a couple of years. And we really need to see that, see that now. Um, so uh, in closing, I want to thank Van City again for making this data accessible um, via the map, beep.eco. And uh, may this data inspire uh, you as businesses to, uh, to continue to innovate um, and demonstrate that this uh, savings um, and emission reductions is, is possible and necessary. Thank you. Hi, um, <clears throat> thank you, Susan and um, Drummond and uh, and Pembina for this invitation. Um, I'm going to uh, walk you through a bit who um, Quadrille is and then how how we've uh, interpreted the Clean uh, BC regulation or <clears throat> guidance and um, take it from there. So for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with Quadrille, uh, we're wholly owned. Uh, entity of BCI, the uh, Public Employees Pension Fund in BC. Uh, we have a mandate to deliver prudent growth and strong investment returns, and we invest in um, uh, real estate domestically and internationally, office buildings, shopping malls, um, warehouses, and multi-residential buildings. Um, so we're, we're growing quickly. Uh, we have about $28 billion in assets under management, uh, about 1,000 employees, and uh, a mandate to grow uh, within five years to about $50, $50 billion. And uh, we have some iconic projects like uh, the Oak Ridge redevelopment, and then a recent uh, purchase in, in Shanghai, of an office building and then doing some new development, including um, Amazon Fulfillment uh, Center in uh, Nose Creek, Calgary. So we're already at a uh, high standard. Um, we're almost 100% uh, green certified to BOMA and or LEED. So almost uh, everything is certified to BOMA. And then there's a few uh, buildings, office buildings that aren't certified to LEED, but um, they, are, they are to BOMA. So, a strong foundation. Um, with that strong foundation, 
uh, we're, we're now focusing a bit more on the the harder to find things and digging deeper into data. We're uh, fortunate to have over 10 years of uh, energy, water, um, data and greenhouse gas data for the portfolio buildings. And this is a neat chart that I'll spend a little time walking through. Uh, so NUI on the left, the uh, y-axis, uh, normalized energy use intensity, so kilowatt hours per square foot. Uh, higher means you're using more energy per square foot. Uh, and then on the uh, x-axis is the year of construction of the buildings. Uh, these are just office buildings. Uh, and then the size of the bubble relates to the size of the building. And um, there are a couple things you can see. Um, the colors relate to province. So the light blue is BC. Um, a couple of trends you see, gener at least in our portfolio, the newer the buildings are, the more efficient they are. Uh, second is that starting in about 2007, when LEED really took off, you see a rapid acceleration in the energy, um, rapid reduction energy intensity per square foot of uh, buildings, uh, from the, the brown one in about 2008 to uh, the, the blue one in 2015. Uh, which is 745 Thurlow, an uh, office building in downtown Vancouver. Um, what's interesting is that, you know, there's a <clears throat> our least efficient building uh, is is also in BC uh, and is located about two blocks away from our most efficient building. And that's uh, so a lot of opportunity. Uh, this type of chart lets us see uh, what are the outliers and where do we need to focus the, the trend line on the right is showing that over the last 10 years, we've improved efficiency about 20%. And if we continue at this pace, uh, we'll by 2030, we'll get to about 15. The Canadian average for office buildings is around 30. So we'll be at about 50% below the Canadian average. And uh, the payback on these projects uh, has tended to be uh, three years. Um, so the 20% the reduction over the last decade, everything's on a three-year payback. Uh, are, are we approved to much higher, but um, it, it's been a very profitable exercise to go through this. Uh, on the, the innovation side, so one of the things that um, Clean BC is, is supporting uh, is innovation low-carbon retrofits. Uh, one of the early adopters is Park Place, uh, downtown Vancouver, office building about 750,000 square feet. One of the first Energy Star certified buildings in Canada, Lead Gold, Bone Best Platinum. What's interesting about this building is that we uh, added in a retrofit to collect the waste heat. In, in Even in winter, the core of the building would get too hot. And instead of uh, putting that waste heat up a cooling tower, uh, we recapture it, um, upcycle it, and uh, we reduce steam consumption. Uh, district steam here is natural gas powered, so about 80% cost savings uh, from steam, about 65% uh, carbon reduction overall for the property uh, within an acceptable payback period. The, the next on cleaner transportation, I think buildings play an important role. This is the um, uh, model for a post office, a redevelopment of the old uh, post office building in downtown Vancouver. And uh, the new codes require you know, significant amount of EV charging within the parking lots. Uh, but further to that, we're actually looking at a few opportunities. So the, the picture on the left, uh, that's Georgia Street. There are a lot of buses that park uh, there that go to the North Shore. Um, we're looking at whether it makes sense to put in a, a high capacity charger that the city might use. Um, and then the next is with the loading docks, should we put in high, you know, tier three chargers because the trucks that will be coming to unload uh, will be uh, natural gas powered. So really trying to think uh, forward about what trends are coming and how do we support things that aren't even emissions in our portfolio, mm -hmm. but helping the partners we work with. Um, waste is a is a big problem. It, it's in in our sector. It's roughly about 10% of emissions from real estate are, are waste driven. Uh, this is a graph that shows the on the left its costs, so, um, dollars per square foot of waste cost, 
and then the orange line is the diversion rate. What's interesting, you do a regression analysis and there's no correlation between cost and diversion rate, but you get these anomalies uh, where uh, the, the cheapest building has some one of the highest diversion rates and that same building that was the worst energy performer is the worst waste performer. So it was lowest diversion rate and 40 cents a square foot. So um, putting taking these graphs, um, sharing them publicly and saying, yeah, recycling doesn't have to cost more. Um, you just have to uh, get better at things that uh, previously weren't paid attention to very much. Um, one of the last things we're uh, applying for funding uh, from uh, from BC to bring in training. We find that the training for on the energy for the technical skills. Uh, is stronger in Ontario uh, with organizations like CIET. Uh, and I know that's a big focus um, of Clean BC is to is to train and uh, upskill people. And we feel that's a major opportunity. We look forward to uh, additional support. Thank you. Super. Thanks, Jamie. So that's the first of the examples of companies that are in the sectors um, involved in the policy. For the for the second one, we'll turn over to Kel Colson. Kel is the manager for policy and external relations at Parkland Fuel Corporation. Parkland is one of North America's fastest growing independent marketers of fuel and petroleum products. It owns Chevron Canada's fuel business and a refinery in Burnaby. Over to you, Kel. Perfect. Can you guys see my screen? Everything's working. So I wanted to start and just introduce our facility. Um, we are previously the Chevron refinery, now the Parkland refinery, and our capacity for manufacturing fuel is 55,000 barrels a day. We produce about 25% of the transportation needs in British Columbia, 30% of YBR's jet fuel, and 30% of the gasoline needs in the lower mainland. We've been operating for about 80 years, and we get our light sweet crude from that infamous pipeline. Uh, under Chevron and Parkland, our approach uh, is to work with governments collaboratively on public policy goals, and that's why we're excited uh, about the initiative that I'm going to share today and how that dovetails into what Clean BC is looking to do. Um, and so one of the things that I find most interesting is when I go and talk to people, a lot of people think refineries produce just gasoline, and obviously we produce much more than that. And so some of our other customers are uh, marine, rail, trucking, and aviation, and those uh, sectors will have a harder time decarbonizing. Um, they're not easy to electrify, and so what we see is the need to lower the carbon intensity of these, um, of these products so that those uh, sectors can help meet their climate targets as well. Uh, one of my favorite things is to talk about retro crude versus new crude. Um, so, you know, I'm sure it's a, it's a very educated audience. Most people know crude oil comes from the ground and a lot of the life cycle analysis is uh, and the carbon intensity is associated with uh, removing um, that crude and processing it. Uh, new crudes are things that are in the, or we consider things that are um, renewables and, uh, and things that are above ground now uh, that we uh, don't necessarily pull more carbon out of the ground. We reuse what's currently um, on the surface. And uh, so we're looking to new crudes that have a lower carbon intensity and lower GHG emissions. Uh, so there's a lot of ways we can meet our targets. Uh, we can um, buy car carbon credits on the market. We can buy renewable fuels and blend them. Um, but what we see is the big prize for us is something called co-processing, where we take renewable feedstock and co-process that with the crude stock that we're running. Um, and so this is the pathway that we are, are working with the province on in terms of exploring. Um, so one of the neat things about co-processing is you're able to use the current equipment and the current uh, skill set that's at the refinery to be able to make those um, low carbon fuels. Um, we're working with de-risking using two feedstocks right now. We, um, we run canola oil and we run tallow oil through our facility to try and understand what that looks like in terms of risk management for our facility. Uh, canola, these are uh, the two products we use now is because they're commercially available at scale at 55,000 barrels a day. We need a lot of um, 
feedstock to be able to produce these fuels. One of the interesting uh, notes about tallow is that currently tallow is shipped from the port in Vancouver over to Singapore, processed at, processed at Neste to make renewable diesel and then is shipped back here and we buy it, our market buys it and blends it as um, renewable diesel. And we have a very similar kit at the refinery. So what we'd like to do is take that tallow and make it and, and reproduce it locally um, so that we're using the infrastructure to be able to make that product and also just save the transportation cost of shipping it to Singapore. So where are we at right now? Uh, we ran a canola test, uh, test run in 2017. That was about uh, 2,000 barrels a day for three days. Uh, we did a longer test run in 2018 for tallow. And now we're, we're getting into our pre-commercial rate, um, pre rateable uh, amount of fuel. So we're looking at um, taking in two to 3,000 barrels um, a day, which is about uh, 400 liters, 400,000 liters of uh, renewable fuel that we can produce. And that ends up, it's not only renewable gasoline, but also renewable diesel and renewable jet. Uh, we can also make renewable jet fuel. Some of the challenges we have is um, trying to get feedstocks that are at this, um, at a volume that's, that makes sense for our facility to run. Um, other challenges include that these new feedstocks have very difficult, different chemical and physical characteristics, and we need to understand those um, in terms of the impact of our facility, such as hydrogen demand, um, catalyst use, and uh, downstream unit impacts. So that's why we've taken this uh, slow approach to being able to understand what we can get to. But with the results so far, we're looking at doing this rateable commercialization in 2020, which the facility is really excited about. But our big prize as a facility is that we're looking at these second generation. So what are current or what are um, feedstocks that we could potentially use to make renewable fuels that are in the research and development phase? Uh, and so these things that are not available at commercial scale, but we, and they're more challenging to work with, but we really do see the value in looking at what's around the province and what can we use. So um, municipal sewage sludge is a project that we're working on with Metro Vancouver. We're working with the forest sector on trying to understand how you can produce biocrudes from forest residuals. Um, and, and we're also working with people like Carbon Engineering to see how we could possibly take their off, um, uh, be an off taker for their facility that they're piloting in, in uh, Squamish. So I just wanted to touch slightly on the municipal sewage sludge project because as a previous um, water engineer and now um, somebody who works in the low carbon fuel sector, it's just a really neat pairing. So this is a project where Metro Vancouver is struggling with what to do with their, um, uh, the biomass generated from wastewater. And one of the, they've been approved to do a pilot where they're taking um, the biomass from the wastewater sector using hydrothermal liquefaction and creating a bio crude. And so we're calling it the wastewater to wheels to wings. But with their facility, they're, they're solving a problem on their end, which is what do they do with that residual? And then on our end, we're able to take that product and repurpose it to a lot, much more higher value product for, for society. So some of the environmental benefits of co-processing that we see is lowering the carbon intensity of liquid fuels across the spectrum, um, reducing the impact and increasing the value of waste residuals. Also important to us is involving the infrastructure that we currently have. Refining is extremely capital intensive and whether you're refining biofuels or refining traditional petroleum, it's, extremely, it's, it's an extremely capital intensive business. Um, so evolving that petroleum infrastructure to meet the needs of the future is something that we think is a real win. Um, also being able to leverage our commercial scale to produce these renewables. Um, other benefits that we find to co-processing is that um, as a um, as Karen touched, we're, we're having this, uh, this transition and with co-processing, we're able to add renewable content uh, to the fuels that are currently being produced um, and consumed by consumers today. Um, there's no engine design or fleet requirements um, and there's no behavior change necessary for consumers. Uh, there's a difference from, for example, between biodiesel, which has some challenges in fleets and renewable diesel, which is chemically equivalent to, to diesel fuel. So when we are producing these items, uh, it's really a, a drop and ready solution. So what we find is that using our, our value proposition is that using the existing infrastructure, both from our industry, as well as looking to places like wastewater is a really um, fantastic way to have the quick turnover to be able to get liquid fuels at a commercial scale that falls under BC's mandate 
the NBC's mandate, and also looking to collaborate with industries to find innovative solutions to be able to repurpose their, their waste for a low carbon economy. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to drop off for the comment section, but um, I'm very interested to hear any questions that come out of the session, and if there's a way that any questions that are directed to us could be um, relayed through my email, I'd be happy to answer them either directly or through a public forum. So I really appreciate being included in this conversation today and look forward to chatting more with you guys in the future. Great. Thank you, Cal. We'll, um, we'll keep all the hard questions for you. Um, send them over by email afterwards. Um, a reminder to everybody, if you'd like to type in questions, please do so in the webinar uh, screen chat, uh, chat box. Um, to get things started, maybe one question um, back for Jamie or Elizabeth is, um, what would you like to see from government or other businesses uh, to keep your businesses on track on this low carbon trajectory? Kind of where else can this go? <clears throat> you want to go first, Jamie? Sure. Uh, I think the, to me, the main thing is really training and awareness uh, and um, in commercial real estate, uh, I mean, there's a handful of us in downtown Vancouver, but um, most of the sustainability knowledge of commercial real estate, there, there may be a hundred people within a few blocks of each other in downtown Toronto who, who know this very well and know the pathways to get to, you know, 30, 40, 50% reductions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need, we need um, support from government to get a whole workforce out there trained with those tools uh, into a much broader, into the you know 50,000 square foot buildings and smaller and out to you know diversity of tenants, so that the we can the expectations of tenants and of small businesses and of um, smaller landlords is yeah this is this is profitable, uh, this is this is good stuff that we should be doing. Uh, in addition to the the environmental mandate, and so I think that's the to me the the skills gap and the having a, a an array of people out there um, with the right knowledge, um, knocking on doors and having conversations is is the key to um, to the, this moving forward. And for um, I have Quadril has the resources. We have a team. Um, I, I forgot to mention, but we've made an 80% uh, commit, uh, commitment to reduce by 80% by 2050 um, through a range of measures, including some renewable energy credits. You know, we're we're on pace to hit 50% already. Um, mm -hmm. These things, as I think a number of speakers have said, these these are not new techniques that we need to dream up. There's a lot of knowledge that's already uh, out there. And it's about spreading it, and it's about um, you know not protecting IP. It's about how do you get more people doing this, and the, uh, I think that, that. Yeah, that that's great. I I um I would have said this the same first two things: training and awareness. And one of the things that uh, you know um, making something visible and even challenging businesses assumptions about where the best opportunities might be to reduce so that's the first aha that we see a lot of companies coming through climate smart um, and then as you said Jamie it's um, it's sharing the stories so that we're not stuck repeating or or, or, or doing R&D like social socialized R&D in a way um, and each of us making a commitment to share us what worked what didn't work what the payback was um, what the unanticipated maintenance costs were, like all of that is really rich sharing so that we can kind of get on with the, with the, with the, with the target and focus on reductions. Um, and this idea that innovation is a, it's a pretty social, uh, social engagement. So, um, and I, I, I think I would say at the end s signals that um, it's, it's fantastic that uh, there are certain really clear um, strategies that the, the policy can anticipate, but I think there's lots of ideas that have that have yet to, to emerge, um, and we need to create an environment where that those ideas are 
um, encouraged through incentive funds and through storytelling so that we're innovating in the next three to five years we're starting to innovate where we're going to get to those deeper reductions with um, you know deeper carbon fuel lower fuel standards or uh, good ideas yeah I'd like to give a lot of credit to um, to the government and the clean BC program for you know taking that longer term view and having core policy elements like the step code that you know what mm -hmm. does really likes is, you know, if you have a 10 year, uh, or you're 13 years out, you know that the buildings need to be um, net zero ready. Um, it, you know, it gives the time for the training. It gives the time to say, oh yeah, we've, we don't have a choice about this. We need to get, we need to find engineering companies that know how to do this. Because we, you know, so I think that regulatory clarity and length is, is, necessary and then once you have that yeah, that training that awareness the sharing of innovation is is what's gonna get us there faster and get us there without um, complaining and um, lobbying against it <laughs> great thanks um, a reminder to uh, feel free to type in any questions in the chat field um, one other is um, how would you say most directly that your business has benefited from pursuing these low carbon strategies? Uh, I mean, for us, there, there are a couple of benefits. One is, um, you know, we're, our strategy for uh, buildings is to try and keep existing buildings to compete with new buildings. So when you, when you have a building, um, it, you, it's worth a lot of money. And what's essential is that you're able to attract great tenants at market rent. And um, the tenants, the bigger the tenants, the more economically rational they are around things like energy cost uh, and around amenities, green amenities, health and well-being amenities. And so, uh, by being early adopters uh, on carbon and early adopters on green certification, we've made sure that our buildings um, are competitive with all the new building stock that's coming on board. And I think that, that for us, that's the key: is if you're if you're early, you have time, and you don't you're not in the getting less rent and playing and playing catch up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would add what we hear from companies is um, traditionally is the bottom line savings, you know, fuel savings and waste. But uh, there's also top line savings, which is, you know, we're, we're securing, we're, we're building, accessing clients that are increasingly asking companies to demonstrate what they're doing on environmental um, issues. And then people. So we've had lots of companies come to us because they did a survey of their staff and the staff were like, what are we doing on environment? Um, I want to work for a company that's taking, that's doing something on this issue. So more of an internal benefit of uh, keeping the place happy and reducing turnover. I'm right. wondering also if I could uh, jump in and uh, just get Jamie and or Elizabeth to unpack a little bit more around the shift from uh, to lower carbon and more energy efficient buildings. What uh, a lot of what I hear at the, in my work uh, with building sector folks and also um, being on the climate council, um, the government's climate council is around the cost of electricity versus gas and how you address that in your move towards lower carbon buildings. Yeah, it's the delta between so natural gas per BTU is cheaper than electricity. Um, it, the key is uh, to go with equipment that has uh, a COP. Someone's going to tell me what that stands for. Um, uh, basically, the the efficiency of the equipment, and so heat pumps are often at like COPs of three or four um, coefficient of performance. I think. So for each unit of electricity that goes into a heat pump, you get three or four units out of heating. And if, if you can get that type of efficiency, you're, you're now competing with natural gas. Uh, and so if you're doing a geothermal project or you're doing, trying to get um, natural old natural gas boilers, replace them with 
um, with, with heat, uh, heat pumps, um, if you go high enough up, up the efficiency spectrum, you can make the math work. Uh, so I think that's that's one. The second is uh, there's certain jurisdictions that don't give you the choice. Uh, so Vancouver on new construction has a greenhouse gas intensity requirement. And so, you know, natural gas as a primary fuel is, is not a, an option. And so I think that's that's a, a second uh, that's there. And then I think the third, when it comes to like smaller buildings and homes, is if you actually dock, if, if you go for a home, a new home with no natural gas, if you add up all the savings of not having to bring a, a natural gas line in and then a, a a plumber fixture for all the natural gas fixtures in your house, um, you're saving thirty, forty, fifty thousand uh, dollars, and so an all electric can actually be cheaper than it's straight out of the gate. Um, so I think it's it's really doing all the math to see does electricity versus natural gas how do they stack up. But it, it's um, and then so my last point is. Uh, there are uh, more creative opportunities if you're in an area that can offer um, district energy or um, you're big enough to have geothermal and you can have a third party pay for the capital. Uh, and so there's different financing arrangements that can make these things uh, a bit more palatable. Cool, okay. thanks. Yes. Um, we actually had a question come through for you, Karen, on whether LNG Canada's phase two is included in Clean BC's projections? Clean BC only incorporates phase one of LNG Canada um, because that was the one uh, phase that had received uh, financial final investment decision and that the government was certain would be moving ahead uh, within the time frame of Clean BC, which is 2030. Um, there's talk that should phase two go ahead that it wouldn't happen until uh, later in the planning horizon so beyond 2030 and beyond cool um and actually uh well another one on the policy side is the additional 25 percent uh in the projections where where do we see that coming from outside of these sectors uh, so there's a lot of work to be done uh, in the transportation sector, for example. Um, we've just scratched the surface on how to address emissions from heavy-duty vehicles and uh, also just making our transportation uh, system much more efficient. Uh, there's also uh, quite a bit that needs to be done still on understanding where emissions from the agricultural sector is. Um, for mm -hmm. the last few years, there's this steady line of two megatons or till 2 million tons of emissions from the agriculture sector. And this is information that comes from the federal government that is then put uh, given to the province and the province is scratching its head trying to figure out well, what is that? And so there's work that needs to be done to understand where those emissions are coming from and how can we reduce those. Um, and of course there's uh, increasing need for electrification in, in the natural gas sector um, as that sector is continuing to be part of part of BC's economy. So there's, um, in addition to what uh, has already been described in terms of electrification opportunities in clean BC, there's still more work to be done there. So those are just some examples um, of, of where the 25% will be coming from. But there'll be more information as, um, as, as government is looking at opportunities um, and as they're bringing those forward, the, there will be announcements throughout the next 18 to 24 months about what those opportunities are. Great. Can I just Can add? Have a, yeah, please. I think I, I was um, at a meeting yesterday and I heard it's called the drive for 25. <laughs> yeah, the campaign. All right, okay. so it's open. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we have a, we've, Kind of one last uh, wrap-up question that's come in, um, and it's what um, you know. What suggestions or best practices are there to share successes and learnings, kind of within and across sectors? And I'll kind of paraphrase that into what are, are what's what are what's advice and uh, ways that businesses can get involved, um, either with the coalition or in their own work reducing emissions, and in the I guess in the leadership towards uh, low low carbon growth more generally. And so for either of you, uh, Jamie and Elizabeth. 
<clears throat> maybe I'll kick off, Jamie. Um, you know, one of the uh, one of the reasons that we've taken a bring people bring peers into a room and go through a training um, approach is is because good ideas come from lots of places. They come from your peers. They come from people who are focused on where where carbon is and small medium sized businesses. They come from your employees, um, and so. Um, we've seen really successful companies who are sharing the what their baseline is, their their data, and getting everybody involved in lots of different ways on how to how to tackle that, and then sharing that with your peers. And that means businesses that are in your sector and businesses that aren't in your sector. Um, and you know, one of the reasons we're really excited to be part of this coalition is because we feel like this is is this exactly the a vehicle and a form that uh, businesses can join to be informed about policy and to weigh in um, beyond their own operations uh, to to help the, the the larger cause and acceleration to our clean economy. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd uh, agree with, uh, with Elizabeth. And um, the thing I'd, I'd add is um, I think I haven't been moving enough. My light went off. Um, there we go. The uh, is is to reach out to your industry association. Many industry associations are not active on this because they don't think their members uh, want them to be active on it. Uh, I think it's really important to uh, vocalize to your industry association that uh, you're expecting them to, to, to be a forum, to share, um, to, to provide uh, best practices in that sector and to create resources to facilitate this. Um, I think that's, uh, there, there are a number of people trying to push uh, for it, but I think that's a, an important forum is using existing networks, uh, but activating them with new content or new, new, a new mission. Great, thank you, that's a great idea. Um, all right, with that, we're done for the webinar for today. I want to say thank you to our panelists. Um, Thank you to Pembina for coordinating, um, and thank you for all of you for joining. If you'd like to learn more, go to pembina.org slash BC Clean Economy, and we'll welcome the continuation of the conversation. Thanks very much. Thanks, Drummond. Thank you.